Chapter 2 Fisher Ames The Responsibility of the Minority One of the neglected men of American history is Fisher Ames, 1758-1808. Apart from his dates, one biographical dictionary has only this to report concerning him. Quote, American politician, born at Dedham, Massachusetts, member of Congress, orator, end quote. He is also remembered at times as the man who declined the presidency of Harvard. Fisher Ames was in his day the great and eloquent voice of federalism with John Adams as its vocal philosopher. Because of his power in Congress, he was the object of the first purge attempted in the history of the United States under the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson had singled Ames out for defeat, hoping that this, quote, Colossus of the monocrats and paper men, end quote, would be retired from the House. But Eames, on November the 2nd, 1792, was re-elected to the Third Congress by an overwhelming vote, receiving 1,627 out of the 2,900 votes cast, and receiving, quote, almost twice as many votes as Benjamin Austin Jr., once more his chief opponent, end quote. What Jefferson could not do, history, through its changing perspective, has done, namely, purge Fisher Ames from his place of eminence. One is almost grateful to Parrington for having, in spite of his supercilious treatment, at least given renewed attention to Ames. Ames, who held the gallery spellbound with his relentless logic and good eloquence, is able to command his readers today. It is readily understandable to readers why only his poor health and enforced retirement prevented him from exercising an even more important role in American history. According to his son Seth, quote, Mr. Ames apprehended that our government has been sliding down from a true republic toward the abyss of democracy and that the ambition of demagogues operating on personal, party and local passions was attaining its object, end quote. Fisher Ames did not place his trust in abstractions or in documents. Constitutionalist though he was, he could declare, quote, Constitutions are but paper. Society is the substratum of governments, end quote. The, quote, best security, end quote, was the old conservative New England society he knew. In 1801, he limited it more sharply, quote, Connecticut is the lifeguard of liberty and federalism, end quote. Ames, it should be noted, was a Massachusetts man. Ames was deeply concerned over the organized subversion coming into America from the French Revolution and the readiness of some to accept these opinions. Whatever the French did against Christianity, the United States and humanity, quote, we stand ready to approve all they do and to approve more than they can do. This French mania is the bane of our politics, the mortal poison that makes our peace so sickly. It is incurable by any other remedy than time, end quote. By 1799, time had aided the situation as the French picture became more obviously one of savage disorder and Ames could observe, quote, Public opinion is the real sovereign of our country and not a very capricious one either. France is neither loved nor trusted. We begin to feel a little patriotism, end quote. The causes of Europe's sickness were, as Ames saw it, very deep and likely to corrupt our America also, whose chance of escaping the infection rested in part on Europe's ability to overcome its sickness. Quote, the morbid cause of the French Revolution lies deep. It is not a rash in the skin, it is a plague that makes the bones brittle and cankers the marrow. The disease is not medicable. End quote. War was needed to educate men, quote, in the ancient manly virtues, end quote, and a new generation with a different perspective. Quote, As to liberty, we are to have none. Democracy will kindle its own hell and consume in it, end quote. By 1807, he was again fearful of the triumph of the French power and of Jacobinism in America. Ames was a man of his time and echoed many of its pat phrases, he was ready on one occasion to see as a, quote, fixed rule and standard of political conduct 
the greatest permanent happiness of the greatest number of people, end quote. However, he was ready to contrast the rule of law with the rule of the popular will, quote, The Washington and Adams administration proceeded on the basis that the government was organized and clothed with power to rule according to the Constitution. The democratic theorists insist that the people, meaning themselves, have a good right to rule, end quote. Ames, coming from democratic Massachusetts' small-town society, was a bitter foe of democracy and spoke bluntly of its defects. Quote, All Democrats maintain that the people have an inherent, unalienable right to power. There is nothing so fixed that they may not change it, nothing so sacred that their voice, which is the voice of God, would not unsanctify and consign to destruction. It is not only true that no king or parliament or generation past can bind the people, but they cannot even bind themselves. The will of the majority is not only law but right. Having an unlimited right to act as they please, whatever they please to act as a rule. Thus, virtue itself, thus, public faith, thus, common honesty are no more than arbitrary rules which the people have as yet abstained from rescinding, and when a confiscating or paper money majority in Congress should ordain otherwise, they would be no longer rules. Hence, the worshippers of this idol ascribed to it attributes inconsistent with all our ideas of this supreme being himself, to whom we deem it equally impious and absurd to impute injustice. Hence, they argue that a public debt is a burden to be thrown off whenever the people grow weary of it, and hence they somewhat inconsistently pretend that the very people cannot make a constitution authorising any restraint upon malicious lying against the governments. So that, according to them, neither religion, nor morals, nor policy, nor the people themselves can erect any barrier against the reasonable or the capricious exercise of their power. Yet, what these cannot do, this spirit of sedition can. This is more sacred than religion or justice, and dearer than the general good itself. For it is evidence that if we will have the unrestricted liberty of lying against our magistrates and laws and governments, we can have no other liberty, and the clamorous Jacobins have decided that such liberty without any other is better than every other kind of liberty without it. Is it true, however, if it be not rebellion to inquire, that this uncontrolled power of the people is their right, and that it is absolutely essential to their liberty? All our individual rights are to be exercised with due regard to the rights of others. They are tied fast by restrictions and are to be exercised within certain reasonable limits. How is it then that the Democrats find a right in the whole people so much more extensive than what belongs to any one of their number? In other cases, the extremes of any principle are so many departures from principle why is it then that they make popular right to consist wholly in extremes, and that so absolutely that without such boundless pretensions they say it could not subsist at all? Checks on the people themselves are not merely clogs, but chains. They are usurpations which should be abolished, even if in practice they prove useful, for they will tell you precedent sanctions and introduces tyranny, Neither Commodus nor Caligula were ever so flattered with regard to the extent of their power and the impiety of setting bounds to it as any people who listened to demagogues. The writings of Thomas Paine and the democratic newspapers will evince that this representation of their doctrine is not caricatured. It is not more extravagant than they represented themselves. They often indeed affirm that they are not admirers of a mere democracy. They know it will prove licentious. They are in favour of an energetic government. End quote. Ames held that a study of the French Revolution was necessary as an example of the logical course of democracy and of revolution as well. He recognised how essential revolution was to this faith as a cure-all for all past ills. Quote, Every Democrat, more or less firmly, believes that a revolution is the sure path to liberty, and therefore he believes government of little importance to the people and a very great impediment to their rights. End quote. 
tyranny gains its foothold by appealing to the evil in man. A tyrant cannot function alone. He must interest, quote, a sufficient number of subordinate tyrants in the duration of his power, end quote. The people are enlisted by assaulting property, quote, the object of the great mass of every faction, end quote. Gradually, not only the property, but also the masses will be stripped of every private right and privilege. When this happens, quote, there is no return to liberty. What the fire of faction does not destroy, it will debase, end quote. Slaves of this sort may dislike their slavery, but it's the outcome of their own lusts and demands. Eventually, testing will come to the American people as it must come to all. It cannot be otherwise. But, quote, we seem to expect a state of felicity before a state of probation. Of our six millions of people, there are scarcely six hundred who yet look for liberty anywhere except on paper. End quote. The Federalists had been seriously in error. They assumed as a natural fact a moral product, character. Quote, Federalism was therefore manifestly founded on a mistake, on the supposed existence of sufficient political virtue, and on the permanency and authority of the public morals. The party now in power committed no such mistake. They acted on the knowledge of what men actually are, not what they ought to be. Instead of enlightening the popular understanding, their business was to bewilder it. End quote. But, quote, a democracy cannot last, end quote. it will then change quote, into a military despotism. End quote. Imperialism will be the outcome. Moreover, as democracy moves into empire, empire does not stand still. Quote, Experience proves that in all such governments there is a continual tendency to unity. End quote. Quote, Ought we not then to be convinced that something more is necessary to preserve liberty than to love it? Ought we riot to see that when the people have destroyed all power but their own, they are the nearest possible to a despotism, the more uncontrolled for being new, and tenfold the more cruel for its hypocrisy? End quote. Ames was, as Parrington charged, a champion of property, but... By this, Ames did not mean moneyed wealth, but a land-based people whose property, business and agricultural was not paper-based, credit-based wealth, but rather established on character and production. His picture of the future was not a hopeful one. Quote, but the condition of the United States is changing, luxury is sure to introduce want, and the great inequalities between the very rich and the very poor will be more conspicuous and comprehend a more formidable host of the latter. The rabble of great cities is the standing army of ambition. Money will become its instrument, and vice its agent. Every step, and we have taken many, towards a more complete, unmixed democracy is an advance toward destruction. Its treading where the ground is treacherous and excavated for an explosion, Liberty has never yet lasted long in a democracy, nor has it ever ended in anything better than despotism. With the change of our government, our manners and sentiments will change. As soon as our emperor has destroyed his rivals and established order in his army, he will desire to see splendour in his court and to occupy his subjects with the cultivation of the sciences. End quote. The power of evil is always the greater where men lack the faith and character which makes them move in terms of truth rather than a lie. Quote, Suppose a missionary should go to the Indians and recommend self-denial in the Ten Commandments, and another should exhort them to drink rum. Who would first convert the heathen? Yet we are told the Vox Populi is the Vox Dei, and our demagogues claim a right divine to reign over us. End quote. Very early, Ames knew the reality of the American scene, that good, strong character was lacking in most. When Indians attacked settlers in one area, Congress began to move for their relief through the army. But these, quote, back settlers, end quote, had a better idea than their relief and rescue, an opportunity to tap the public treasury in return for defending their own homes and families. Quote, they wished to be hired as volunteers at two-thirds of a dollar a day to fight the Indians. 
they would drain the treasury, end quote. What was Ames's answer? It was twofold. First, there was needed, quote, the miracle of virtue that loves others first, then oneself, end quote. Here Ames revealed the transition of the New England faith from piety to moralism. He was himself a part of the theological decline in that he saw Christianity in terms of the Edwardian concept of general benevolence rather than as a justifying faith. Second, Ames felt that even a small minority could exercise great power if it moved in terms of principle. In 1807, with the Federalist Eclipse, he could assert, quote, Even now, federalism checks, though it cannot govern. It is fitter to check than to rule. It is better to suffer the fatigue of pumping than to sit sullen till the ship sinks, end quote. More can be said in this matter. History has never been commanded by majorities, but always by dedicated minorities. We have seen the havoc wrought in American history by minority groups playing their balance of power game. This was not what Ames had in mind. Rather, he held to the responsibility of the privileged minority, and, for him, the privileged minority was made up of people like those whom he knew and loved best, his New England neighbours, men of simple faith and strong virtues. The revolution, we've been told, was fought as a, quote, minority war, end quote, with perhaps one third more or less loyal to George III, one third indifferent, and the other third in favour of resistance to the invading troops. This estimate may or may not be accurate, but what is true is that at first only a dedicated minority recognised the implications of their defence of liberty and was ready to face those implications. Gradually, men became ready to pledge their lives, their fortunes and their sacred honour to the cause. But before the people followed, there first came the dedicated minority. We can thus, with slight alteration, agree with Ames's analysis and answer. First it needed the miracle of faith, and then the dedicated minority. Already that minority checks, although it cannot govern. <laughs>